Hello, David Diga Hernandez here, and you're watching Spirit Church on Encounter TV. Today, on this edition of Spirit Church, I'll be addressing the topic of demon possession. Now, there is a lot of superstition that surrounds this topic, and because of that superstition, there are a lot of fears that are unfounded that believers carry in their hearts. But if we look to the Word of God for our information, for our revelation, on this topic, then we will be equipped to become people who can command the forces of darkness to release those who are bound. And as we explore this topic through the Bible, we're also going to be answering some questions that I believe many of my viewers will have in their hearts. Specifically, we're going to be addressing the question, can believers become demon-possessed? We're going to address that in just a moment. But first, Stephen Moctezuma is here with me as usual. He's going to lead you in some worship, and then we're going to come right back to this lesson. Here's Stephen Moctezuma. And I will sing of all you've done. I'll remember how far you carried me from beginning until the end. You are faithful, faithful to I will sing of all you've done And I remember how far you carried me From beginning until the end You are faithful, faithful to the end to the end to the end I will sing and I will sing of all you've done I remember how far you carried me from beginning till the end you are faithful faithful to the end oh to the end i was ministering at a youth conference in the east coast when I experienced something in the spiritual realm that I had up until that point never experienced. I was ministering my message. I believe I was ministering on how we are the light of the world. It was a basic message, and I was going to be praying for those who were in attendance at that conference that night. But in the middle of my sermon, as I'm preaching under the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'll tell you, the anointing of the Holy Spirit had saturated that building. So the power of God was resting on the people in attendance. And I'm ministering my message. I'm just about halfway through when all of a sudden the Holy Spirit directs me to begin to lay hands on people, to begin to prophesy, to begin to impart spiritual things. And in the middle of all that's happening, all of a sudden in this beautiful move of the Holy Spirit, we hear this shriek. And when we heard this shriek, this scream, Everybody in the room could sense the ugliness about that scream. And I had sensed the familiarity of the demonic spirit. I knew the moment I heard that scream that this was someone who was in demonic torment, somebody who was in their heart hoping to receive freedom from what the Lord was doing in that moment. And they began to scream. And I looked over and it was this girl who was on the floor writhing. And I mean, she was twisting, she was turning, she was in, it looked like a lot of pain. And really what that was, was the spiritual, emotional torment that the demonic being was causing and inflicting upon her. She was being demonically harassed. And I knew in that moment, this girl had a demon. This girl was demon possessed. And so I remember I went to go begin praying for her. I said, pick her up and bring her here to the front. 
The ushers were at that moment trying to take her out of the building. I said, no, pick her up and take her down to the front. And so they grab this girl by the arms and they start to pull her toward the front. And as she's approaching, she's pushing back on the approach with her feet because as she neared the platform, she began to scream even louder and she began to convulse violently. And no sooner that they had brought her to the altar was there suddenly another shriek. This time it was a a man. He began to scream. Same thing. He falls on the floor, begins to writhe in torment. He begins to twist and turn just as she was doing. And so I said, bring him too. But one by one, all over this room, there's about three or 400 youth and young adults gathered there. This is back when I only did youth services. Now I can't remember the last time I did a youth service. But I remember because all around the room, demons began to manifest. People began to scream. The torment, the harassment began to surface in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And before I knew it, there was anywhere from eight to 12 people who were demonically possessed, and they had all been brought to the front. I said, stand every single one of them up. So they start picking them up. There's ushers behind each one of them holding them up. And these people, it was quite a sight to see. Everyone in the crowd was pretty much shocked at what was happening. There was a gasp that came over the room every time someone began to manifest. And so here they are, eight to 12 people in front of me, about a dozen people, and they're all harassed by demonic spirit. They were all demon possessed. And so I looked down and I was thinking, Lord, this is going to take quite a while. And I remember the Holy Spirit spoke to me, said, don't lay hands on any of them. Just have them all stand up and you're going to rebuke them all at once right now. So I trusted what the Holy Spirit had instructed me to do. They were all standing. And as they're standing there, I boldly prayed in the name of Jesus. That's what I said. I said, in the name of Jesus, I command every demonic spirit to go. Now, when I said in the name of Jesus, no sooner that I pronounced the first syllable of his name, were they again all back on the floor. I said, in the name of G, and they all fell out on the floor. The power of God hit them all. And all at once, they're on the floor and they let out collectively a violent scream. They shook again violently, and then the room went silent. And every single one of them came up off of the floor with tears streaming down their faces, with hands uplifted. They begin to praise Jesus. They begin to worship the name of Jesus. In one instant, all 12 of them were completely delivered. Now, last week I taught on the origins of demonic beings. I talked about the source of where, from where demons come. Now, looking at the origins of demonic beings, we see that demonic beings were the Nephilim. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and look at my teaching, the origins of demons, and that'll help lead up to this one. You don't need to have seen that one to know about this one, but I'm just giving you a quick recap here. Now, Those demonic beings had lost their bodies. Demonic beings are parasites. When they leave a vessel, when they leave the possessed individual, they become tired and weary. They lose strength. Look at this verse in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. And this is Jesus speaking about a demonic spirit. He says, when an evil spirit leaves a person... It goes into the desert seeking rest, but finding none. Then it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home empty, swept, and in order. Verse 45. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this evil generation. Now, Jesus is talking about the emptiness of a vessel who was delivered. When someone has a demon cast out of them, if they're not saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, that demonic being will come back and it will come back with seven other spirits and that person's state will be worse than before. But what I want to primarily focus on from this selection of scripture is the fact that when a demon comes out of someone, It goes around seeking rest. Demons lose strength when they are without a human vessel. This is why they seek to possess people. In fact, they seem very uncomfortable 
with being outside of a body. Remember when Jesus cast the legion out of that man and commanded them to go, or allowed them, I should say, to go into the pigs. Those pigs went off the cliff. Those demons begged to be sent into a body, even if those bodies were the bodies of pigs because they're uncomfortable outside of a vessel. They need a vessel to have strength. They need a vessel to do their work. And so this is why demonic beings, parasitic in nature, seek to possess a vessel. Now, demons grow tired outside of the body. They need strength. By contrast, inside of a body, once a demon has possession over a vessel, they gain great strength. Mark chapter 5, verses 2 through 4 says, When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. He broke the chains. Verse 4 says, Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Remember the scripture says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, let's take a look at that verse. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. These were mighty men. In fact, these were who the ancients worshipped. They considered them gods. And so we see that these demonic beings, these Nephilim, had tremendous amounts of strength, so that when they possess a human vessel, that human vessel receive strength themselves. They receive a supernatural physical enabling. Now that is not always the case, but it tells us something about demonic beings. They desire to possess bodies because it allows them to do their work with greater strength. Now, I want to take a side note here. Some of you had asked about this verse in Genesis chapter 6, uh, Genesis chapter 6 verse 4, and how the scripture says that there were giants in the land in those days and afterwards. Now, it's possible that the giants that were there afterwards were not as gigantic as the giants before, that perhaps there was something with the genetics that changed. Who knows? But I also must concede that it's also possible that the angels procreated with the women a second time after the flood, which could very well have been. But again, these I'm not dogmatic on some of these issues. The point is that we should know the nature of our enemies. So I will concede that point. That's a very distinct possibility that we see in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. So this is why men get great strength, though, is because they're being taken over. They're being possessed by these creatures, these vile beings that once had great strength that put them in the minds of the people to a godlike status. These were the ancient beings, and I believe this also could be the root of the false religions of the world. Many of the ancient religions can find their truth from these strange ancient creatures with great strength, great power, great knowledge. It sounds like demonic beings to me. They want to be worshipped. They want to be adored. They want to be praised by men. And so that is a side note, but it's an interesting one nonetheless. Now, demons do have limitations, and that's another topic for another day. But one of those limitations, as it goes with demonic beings, is that they cannot possess Christians. And I'm going to give you scriptural references for this, or at least scriptural truths. Now, I want to say this. There are many open doors that we have in our lives that we can open to the demonic realm. Demonic beings can affect believers, but they cannot possess them. Demonic beings can only possess the unbeliever. And I'm going to give you my reasons why I believe that in just a moment. However, I want to focus in on this point for a moment. This does not mean that the Christian has no worries whatsoever when it comes to demonic beings. In fact, the scripture tells us that we wrestle against these spiritual beings. The Bible tells us to be vigilant and sober and to watch out for our enemy, the devil. Why? Because they are a real threat. Having said that, I also want to balance this by letting you know if you're a believer, if you've put your faith in Jesus, and again, there is a lot of paranoia and superstition surrounding topics like these. So people will ask me questions all the time. Brother David, I fell into sin. 
but I repented, but I still feel like I have a demon in me. Or Brother David, I used drugs, but I repented and I still feel like I have a demon in me. And there, people can become very paranoid when it comes to this topic. But I want to tell you something. Your salvation wasn't earned and your salvation cannot be kept by actions. Salvation is as simple as putting your faith in Christ Jesus. It is faith alone. Am I saying we don't need to live holy lives? Absolutely not. We must live holy lives. But holiness is not the production or is not the producer of salvation. Holiness is the result of salvation. That's again another topic for another time. And I'm going to be superficially addressing these side concepts so that I can focus in on this main point that I'm trying to make. So, well, it is true that demons can affect a believer. Well, it is true that salvation is by faith alone. That's to calm your fears for those of you who are believers in the Lord, yet are constantly questioning your standing spiritually and are constantly wondering if perhaps you might have a demon that has attached itself to you in some way. I want to encourage you to know that while we must not be apathetic when it comes to demonic powers, we must also avoid being anxious when it comes to demonic powers. So, can demons possess a believer? No, and again, I'm going to get into that in a moment, but I really do want to take some time with this point because I know there is someone watching who is absolutely terrified. And I want to take my time for you because I know that this can be a very deep-rooted bondage and it can cause torment on your mind. I want you to be free of that torment. If you believe that Jesus is Lord, that God raised Him from the dead, if you put your faith in Christ for your salvation, that settles it, you're saved. It's by the blood of Jesus. It's by grace alone, by grace through faith. You are saved by what Christ Himself accomplished on the cross. It's not by your actions, and it's not by your doing. So, having said that, there also is a reality that the believer can be affected by demonic beings. And we're going to get more into that next week when I talk about the attacks of demonic powers. By the way, all of this is coming out of my book, 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare, which is available right now. In fact, we're doing something at our ministry, and I don't know how long we're going to do this for, but you can get Carriers of the Glory and 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare. It's a two-for-one book bundle. It's $25. You're going to get free shipping in the U.S., and there's also an option there where you can add that I'll do a signature on both of the books for you. So I don't know how long we can keep this up, but do that now. We do have very limited supplies. We got the first shipment coming in. I promise you that a lot of people are going to take those books. So I don't know if we will have enough and you may have to wait another month or so once that shipment's gone so we can print more. So you can go ahead and do that today if you're interested in getting deeper. I mean, on these videos, I can only go so far, but the book really deals more deeply with these issues. So can the believer be demon possessed? First, let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 23. Now, may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Spirit and soul and body. This verse right here is what many who believe that the believer can be demon possessed point to as supposed proof that the believer can be demon-possessed. They'll say, well, we are comprised of the body, the soul, and the spirit. And because we are comprised of the body, the soul, and the spirit, this means that though our spirit is filled with the Holy Spirit, there is still something in our soul that can be possessed. However, the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. It is the will of man, not even God himself will take control over the will of a man. Not even God will violate the free will of a human being. How much less is a demonic being allowed to violate the free will of a human? Besides, the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So there you go. He, the demonic being cannot possibly, if you are a believer, cannot possibly possess your spirit. It just can't be done. That is the connection with God. So we also see the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have 
of God and ye are not your own? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. If you are a born again believer, if you are someone who is spirit filled, then your body can't even be demon possessed because the Holy Spirit himself dwells there and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So he can't dwell in your spirit and he can't dwell in your body. He can't dwell in your spirit because that is your communion with God. That is the place of fellowship with the Lord. Even when you feel you've been cut off by God, that fellowship spirit to spirit is still taking place. This is the mercy of God. And it's not because you deserve it. It's not because you've earned it. It's not because of the past penance that you've paid or the past things that you've done in ministry for the Lord that cause him to show you mercy in the seasons where you have shortcomings. That's not the issue at all. God doesn't give us mercy because you, you or I deserve it. God gives us mercy because he's faithful and he cannot deny who he is. He is faithful even when we are not. So, that spirit connection is always there. Demons cannot possess the spirit. That is the place where the power is. That is the place where the spirit himself dwells. How can a demonic being come anywhere near the presence of the Holy Spirit? It can't be done. So the spirit can't be possessed. The body can't be possessed because it's the temple of the Holy Ghost. What about the soul? Again, not even God will give himself power over the soul. And I was having, um, even before, this was probably about maybe a year and a half ago when I first started thinking about this book, uh, I went to dinner, it was with Steve, and he pointed out, as I was sharing with him this over dinner, this is when I was still planning the book, and this is one of the concepts I was talking about, he pointed out that it's possible that animals do not have souls. Now, leave it to Steve to point out something that odd, but remember when Jesus cast the demonic beings into the pigs? Here's a very philosophical way of looking at this. Animals, biblically speaking, cannot have souls as we imagine them to have. Otherwise, it would be immoral for God to require them as sacrifice or for God to offer them as food. It wouldn't be moral. It would violate the intrinsic nature of the goodness of God. And going just off this philosophical approach, using biblical context, we can discover that the nature of God and His goodness points to the fact that demons cannot possess souls. Why? Because they possess the pigs. And again, this you, you can follow the logic there. However, in a simpler way of putting it, demonic beings are themselves spiritual beings. They are themselves of the ethos. And so, this means that they require bodies. Demonic beings are not looking for spirits. They're not looking for souls. They're spiritual beings themselves. In fact, a demonic being cannot have a spirit because spirit refers to the connection with God. So they have to be of the soulish realm, so to speak. And that adjective is not an official adjective, but it's something that some theologians use. Now, demonic beings require bodies. They seek out bodies. I don't believe that the believer can be demon-possessed for all those reasons and for the very fact that if the soul dwells in a body that is filled with the Holy Spirit, that within itself is connected to a spirit that is filled with the Holy Spirit, that a demonic being cannot possibly have any access through any way because it is too near to the presence of God in that being. In other words, you can only be filled with one spirit. The Holy Spirit only fills what is empty. And demonic beings, when they are cast out of someone, they look for someone who is empty. So Christians, absolutely, positively, biblically speaking, cannot be demon-possessed. So there are still some of those paranoid believers who feel as though they are. Can I be honest with you? Sometimes it may just be anxiety. Sometimes it may just be paranoia. Now, I'm not trying to make you apathetic toward demonic beings. That would be to go into the other extreme. I'm simply saying that sometimes believers overthink things because they come of a religious mindset. Religious mindsets are performance-based. And instead of looking to biblical principles and biblical truths, they, they want to be assured of every specific situation. I'm telling you, I get the weirdest emails from the most fearful people. I get 
questions all the time, Pastor David, I was a little skeptical that angels might exist, that I commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And I'm thinking, was, well, there was no connection between any of that in Scripture. Or Pastor David, I, I sinned one time, and I know the Bible says God forgives me, but I committed fornication, or I did drugs, or I lied to somebody I wasn't supposed to lie to. And instead of just accepting the fact that God forgives and letting that truth apply to them also, they for some reason exclude themselves from God's truth. And they'll say something to the effect of, Brother David, I know that the Bible says this and that about forgiveness, and I know it says that God is willing to forgive me, and I know it says that God is merciful and that His mercies are new every morning. However, I feel and I'm wondering if perhaps God can forgive me. And I'm thinking, well, what does the Bible say? So believers have this very paranoid approach quite often to spiritual warfare, and especially when it comes to demonic beings. They're always wondering, did I open a door? Did I? And if you're living like that, you're living in paranoia, you're living in fear, that's not what God called you to do, and your theology is backwards. If your theology inspires paranoia, it's not true. If your theology inspires superstition and a constant questioning of every little thing, every little mistake you make, then guess what? The, that is not true theology. True theology is perfect peace. True theology is when Christ himself is the center. So the scripture points to a sound biblical approach to demonic beings. Now, this begs the question, what about those believers who seem to be possessed? Whenever you see someone exhibiting the behaviors of a demoniac or someone who is demon-possessed, you have to ask yourself this question. Are they truly possessed? Because the two can't go together. You can't be a believer and possessed. You can't be possessed and a true believer. Now, some people say, well, I think I have a demon, therefore that disqualifies me from being saved. Again, that's paranoid thinking. Why can't it be that you're not actually possessed? Why can't it be that you're not actually demonically influenced? Well, because I'm so afraid of it. Why are you afraid of it? It's because you're allowing your mind to take on doctrines that the scripture did not give us to take on. And so I know this is very deep and it even goes into psychology a little bit. And that's true because it has to, because demonic beings affect psychology. They affect emotions. They affect the mind. And they'll even lie to you. Ironically, coming to the realization that you're not demon possessed or that you're not actually demonically influenced can be just as liberating as actually being free from a demonic power. So in that sense, there is some irony. However, those people who exhibit that behavior, either they aren't really demon possessed or they aren't really saved. I remember one time I was in, I accompanied a pastor who had got a phone call to go to this hotel room where someone was exhibiting the behavior of a demoniac. This person was demon possessed. And so the pastor went to go lay hands on this, this kid and he knew the kid. So I walked in the room, I saw these guys, I thought this is amazing and not in a good way. I mean, I was amazed at how their behavior was so strange, so vulgar, so vile. And this pastor leaned over and he put his hand on him and this kid spit in the pastor's face. And the pastor was, okay, he stood, he kept his cool. He stood very calm. He grabbed, I believe there was some Kleenex there and he, he wiped his spit off his face. And he says, we're gonna find out if you're actually demon possessed or not right now. And so he prayed in the name of Jesus, I command this demonic spirit to leave. And that was it, he left it at that. Basically what he was saying is that if someone is actually demon possessed, if it really is a demon that somebody has in them, then a simple prayer of casting that devil out is going to cast the devil out. I've seen people take hours to cast out devils. Why? Either the person isn't really demon possessed or they don't want to be free in that moment. Or it's the third option that Jesus gave us and that some of these only come out through prayer and Fasting, some versions say. Some versions say prayer, others say fasting. So those are three options when someone is exhibiting demonic behavior and you don't actually think they have a demonic spirit. Either they are just being emotional or they don't want to be free from that demonic spirit or that demonic spirit requires prayer and fasting. But we have to stop judging our theology on our experience. We have to stop basing our theology on our experience. We need to base our theology on what the Word of God says. So even if your experience tells you something else, well, I, I saw a Christian one time, and they were, a believer, or they were a pastor, they were a leader, and they started manifesting. They for sure had a demon. What does the Bible teach? That's not a possibility. 
So it's one of two things again. Either they weren't really demon-possessed or they weren't really saved. I say usually it's that they're not really demon-possessed. They're emotional. Maybe they're having a panic attack. I'm not saying even that there's no such thing as demonic possession. I'm saying we have to have a balance in all things. And we have to avoid apathy and anxiety when it comes to dealing with these things. So Jesus, when he dealt with demonic spirits, Jesus never took more than a few seconds. He cast them out with a word. Time and time again, he would cast them out with a simple word, with a simple command. In fact, the scripture says that when the evening came, he cast the devils out of everyone who was there. Now, if it was already evening and there was a few hundred people there, he couldn't have spent more than a minute with each one if he was going to get to every single one of them before the night came. So Jesus commanded the forces of darkness with such authority, with such power, that he just spoke a word and the demonic spirit fled. Now, this is why when I pray for someone who's demonically influenced, I don't go, I've seen people, they hit them with the Bible. And I'm thinking, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, don't hit them with the Bible. And I've seen people, they take three hours and they're interviewing the demon. How did you get in this person? At what age did you get in there? Did you come through trauma? What was the open door? What was the sin? And by the way, I'm talking about open doors next week, but they'll go on all of them. They're interrogating the demon, thinking, I never saw Jesus do that. When the power of the Holy Spirit's on your life, you don't actually have to do that. You can simply, time and time again, if you've ever come to one of my services, you'll see the way I cast out a devil is in the name of Jesus, come out of this person right now. The person will hit the floor and they get up worshiping God. It's that simple. Now, some people say, but Brother David, you got to deal with the root issue. You got to go deeper. What if there's some stuff still buried in there? No, the scripture says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, absolute liberty. And so when you cast the devil out of someone, when you cast the demon, there's no effort on your part. There's no training on your part that needs to be done. The scripture says in Mark chapter 16 that they who believe will cast out devils. They who believe what? The message of the disciples. They didn't have any special training. They didn't have to become demon experts. They didn't have to go and prepare themselves with the fast. No, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are immediately ready to begin casting out demons. You are ready to be casting out demons right now. Can the demonic beings retaliate? Sure they can. But their attacks affect the believer in a different way than the unbeliever. And again, we're getting to that next week, what they can actually do to the believer. However, the point here is that you must have boldness. You have to let the boldness of God rise within you. When you cast the devil out, it's as simple as in the name of Jesus, come out of this person right now. And if the demonic being doesn't seem to respond, ask yourself those three questions. Is this person really demon possessed? Is this person wanting to be free from this demonic spirit. And then if, again, if it messes with your theology, that's what that third one is for, is this person actually saved? So this way, when you're approaching this, there's perfect peace, there's no confusion, it's simple. Again, remember, all spirituality, true spirituality is simple. Spirituality is founded upon simplicity. And so I know there are a lot of questions we still have to get through. and. You know, I like to try to keep these videos under 40 minutes. Otherwise, fewer people watch them. It's a lot of information. So that is it for this lesson. I want to pray with you now that God would so embolden you to begin to cast out demons, to begin to go and be that one who is so filled with the Holy Spirit, who is so filled with the confidence that you would begin to go and just cause the captives to be free. Look, I understand that if you're compromising in sin, the demonic beings can retaliate and affect your emotions, your mind. They can't possess you. They can't curse you. They can't put sickness on you. They can't physically harm you. But what they can do is retaliate with lies that you're more susceptible to believe because of the compromise. And again, that's next week's lesson. But I want to pray with you now. Come on, put your hand toward mine. And let's believe that God would empower you today. Father, in Jesus' name. I pray for that one watching to receive boldness from your word. Lord Jesus, you were the one who commanded the forces of darkness and at your word they fled. Lord, so anoint that one watching that at their very word, demonic beings will instantly flee in the name of Jesus. And I want you to say, if you believe it, amen. And I want to just take a moment to quick side note here. Again, if your experience is that the demonic being doesn't instantly flee, just remember there are other options to consider 
This doesn't mean that the scripture isn't true or that you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. I love you guys. You should be getting now. Um, we sent out an email blast uh, welcoming all the new members of Spirit Church. Some of you have been members for a long time and got that email. We just began to do that, but now everyone who signs up will automatically get that email. We love you. We are praying for you. You're from all over, different parts of the nation, different parts of the world. Thank you for joining the Spirit family. I want to now get to your comments. So this is the video, The Presence of the Holy Spirit in Southern California. Last week I was doing a conference in Florida with William McDowell, and there were many other mighty men of God there, but my friend, Pastor William McDowell, put on a tremendous conference. There's something special going on at Deeper Church Fellowship in Orlando, Florida, and the miracles were just tremendous. Watch uh, this upcoming World Changers update to see a miracle where a lady who was paralyzed from a stroke was completely healed. I ministered on the Thursday afternoon session, and miracles broke out. We got footage from that, but anyway, this clip here we aired because I didn't have time to put the lesson together because I was at that conference, but this is the presence of the Holy Spirit in Southern California, and here's the comments on that. This is Darian Rodriguez writes, Oh, that's me. I guess this person was saw themselves in the video being prayed for. Wow, didn't realize everything was being filmed, but what a strong reminder of God's strength. Thank you, David. Christina Bell writes, Beautiful. Always a blessing to see the people of God in worship. Birthday wishes. There's a common commenter. We appreciate all your comments. Birthday wishes. Watching this, I can feel the presence of God. Wow, just well. And we love getting those comments because one of the things that makes this channel, this ministry distinct is the presence of the Holy Spirit that so powerfully manifests on it. Connie Ferris writes, God is so amazing. As I was watching this video and praying and worshiping with you all, the Holy Spirit filled my room with his presence. David, bless you, sweet anointed brother. You are so loved by the Lord that he has given you amazing gifts to share with the world. And my goal is that you too would be raised because God has anointed. If you're watching this, I want you to know God has anointed you to do it too. Sid Roth has a great saying and I love it. He says, anything I can do, you can do better. Melanie Marquez writes, to Jesus be all the glory. We have another commenter who writes, awesome move of the Holy Spirit, praise the Lord. And Cargat843 writes, I would love to be there and experience the presence. Well, if you'd like to know when I'll be coming to your area, I travel quite extensively. And if you'd like to invite me to your church, first off, your pastor watching this, I take ministry invitations all the time. You're just going to go to davidhernandezministries.com slash booking. But if you want to know where I'm currently scheduled to go, go to davidhernandezministries.com slash events and sign up there. If you go to my Facebook page, the fan page, not the regular, there's, there's two Facebooks that I have, but one, the one with the blue check mark. If you go to that one, there's an events tab that you can subscribe to on Facebook and it will notify you every time I put up a new event. Don't turn off the video just yet. I want to talk to you for a moment. If you're appreciating everything that's coming out of this ministry, you're a member of Spirit Church and you love what this ministry is doing, not just through this broadcast Spirit Church, but through television and through events all around the world, you want to help me continue to take the gospel, then I challenge you, become a $30 a month partner today. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Remember, we need 1,000 new $30 a month partners to get our new facility. We want it to be a 24-7 prayer room. It's going to be somewhat of a miracle center. I believe people will come in all over the world, from all over the world to receive their miracles. Don't say he's talking to somebody else. You know, if everyone who watches this video signs up, we can have it in a day and we can begin going. Now, if you're a partner, please stay partnered with this ministry. Don't quit. Your gift is making a difference. So go ahead and do that today. Click on the link that is about to appear over my head. You're going to click on that. It's going to take you to the website. You can sign up. Sign up today. Help partner with me. I need your help. Help me continue to make a difference and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Hey fam, Stephen Moctezuma here. I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel and to share our content. I hope you're enjoying all the content that we're sending your way. In addition to David's teachings and ministry videos, you can also join me on my worship playlist where I release a brand new video every week. Thank you guys so much for watching Encounter TV. God bless.